we have Dr. Biswajit Mahapatra with us. I will just introduce him and he will take you through the journey of sustainability of DevSecOps. Dr. Biswajit Mahapatra has been heading the customer solutions management for AWS, Amazon Web Services. He is a highly experienced global professional with hands-on experience as CEO, CDO, CTO, and CSO. He has extensive background in value creation, building organizations, helping companies in their digital deployment strategies, and of course, technological advancements. So over to you, Mr. Mahapatra. Let's welcome him on the stage with a huge round of applause, and let's have a wonderful session on the topic, architecting DevSecOps sustainability. Over to you, doctor. Very good. So first of all, Thanks for being here. I know we have the organizers speaking in the other room, so I was not expecting even people to attend. But uh, thanks to ma'am, at least some of you are here. Uh, so that gives me little motivation and little energy to start my session. Right? Uh, the second thing, welcome to DevOps India Summit 2023. Uh, uh, it's really a great opportunity for me because I have been speaking on DevOps India Summit uh, in the past, but it was all virtual, right? So coming in person together uh, after probably many years is a great thing, right? Uh, the other part is the entire industry has changed really for all of us, right? So events like this definitely provides us a platform to share knowledge, to collaborate, and understand the power of DevSecOps and sustainability. That's what I'm going to talk today. To start my presentation, I'm just going to set little context as all of us know, the world has completely changed, right? Uh, more so, I know any presentation today doesn't get completed without uh, the word called pandemic, right? So after pandemic, things has really changed. Uh, the pandemic has given us many challenges in the same time, many opportunities as well, right? As you really look at, the world has become more intelligent today, more interconnected today, and more instrumented as well. And that has given us, all of us here and across the globe, an opportunity to think differently, to act differently, transform into new ways of doing things, socially, economically, as well as technically. Right? That's the evolution of new business paradigm that is happening around all of us. And if I really talk about this evolution, it's actually happening around three dimensions. The first dimension is all about new business model. As all of us know, and many of us are experienced and senior here, the entire business model is changing. Organizations are reimagining their business processes. Right? The second lever is all about new way of doing things. You heard in the previous sessions in the other room, there is a lot of focus on actionable insights. There is a lot of focus on how do you really make your operations more and more responsive. The third lever, which is not the least, not the last lever, right, but very important lever, it's all about new ways of doing work. When I say new ways of doing work, how can we build restless talent within our organization? Every CIOs, every CXOs, Prime focus area is that, right? How can I build restless talent? Second point is orchestrated operation. What does that mean? There is no longer competition exists today in the industry, right? And which uh, ex-CEO of IBM, Ginny Romati, used to say, it's all about competition. Competition and cooperation. Today, business is such a way that you need to really cooperate and work with your competition to meet your customers growing demands to deliver the outcomes, deliver the value to your customers. And when these three levers evolving the new business paradigm, we know about all the next gen technologies that's available to all of us today. Some are listed on the slide, probably some are not, starting from cloud. Cloud is a foundation technology today for all of us. Apart from cloud, we talk about AI ML, uh, IoT, blockchain, right? quantum computing, high performance computing. So there are a lot of focus. Some are at different stages of adoption within the organization, but the joining has already started. 
maybe cloud has taken a greater uh, joining as compared to quantum or HPC, which is just coming up now. But the adoption has started for all of those technologies, right? And if you really talk about, the, uh, think about these technologies, some way or other, they are leading into what we hear in the morning today, Green Foundation and other things that's happening. All of these technologies are leading towards nothing but what we call as sustainability. Do you guys agree with me on this? Perfect. So now, with that backdrop, what I'm going to do for the next couple of minutes, talk about three important things. The number one, I'm going to talk about what is mission of, since I work for AWS, I represent AWS, I'm going to talk about what is AWS or Amazon's mission for sustainability. Right? That's the first thing I'm going to talk about. Then the second part of my talk is going to be around how AWS, AWS is architecting for sustainability. Right? So as you guys saw my topic, architecting DevSecOps sustainability, I'll start, start with sustainability, then I'll go to the second part, architecting for sustainability, and then the third thing, which is probably important for all of you here today, how to start with, and many of you are practicing DevSecOps, right? Can I just make a raise hand here? Yeah, probably all of you, right? So if you are practicing DevSecOps, so how do we really start with DevSecOps sustainability? What is in it for me? How do we take that baby step to start the journey of sustainability? That's going to be the third part of my talk today. Okay? Good. So let's start with what is AWS mission for sustainability. Before I talk about AWS mission for sustainability, probably I, since lesser number of people are there, I'll probably try to make it a little interactive, right? So what do you think? What does sustainability mean to you? If few of you can answer, what does really sustainability mean to you? With all the discussions we have in the morning, with uh, so much uh, discussion happening in the industry around sustainability, what do you think? What is sustainability? Green energy, okay. Carbon footprint, okay. Circular IT, very good. What else? I'll just put a very layman definition so that we all are aligned to the definition, right? And that's what I'm going to talk about now. Meet the, meet the need of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. You all will agree with me on this definition? That's what is sustainability, right? And if I talk about this, I'm going to talk about one of my customer. How many of you drink coffee? We just came back from coffee break, right? All of you drink coffee? Your favorite coffee? Which brand? Nescafe, not Starbucks? Yeah? Costly, okay, okay. Yeah, good, so I'm going to talk about Starbucks today. Okay, and that's one of my customers where we did some work on sustainability, right? And I'm, of course, allowed to talk about Starbucks because it's a public re reference for Amazon Web Services today. Okay? And look at the definition here. Meet the need of the present. All of us need to drink Starbucks coffee or not at the start of the day while traveling, right? That's need of, our, need of all of us today or not? It's need of all of us today, right? without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their needs. In future also, people will need to drink coffee or not, or they will drop somewhere. They'll drop the coffee. So coffee, need for coffee is going to be there all throughout. You guys agree with me? Right? So what is sustainability in this then? Coffee drinking is today, coffee drinking is going to happen after 10 years, Starbucks, of course, the, maybe the, they may come up with some newer variants of coffee, but still coffee, people will drink coffee, right? Then what is sustainability here? What is really Starbucks doing when it comes to sustainability? Of course, they have a need now because there's a need today and they are not going to compromise the ability of future generation because future generation also needs to drink coffee, right? So what is then Starbucks is doing today? Typical, those of you who have gone to Starbucks, I'm assuming everyone, right? That's my customer, you guys should go so that they earn money, then I earn money, right? And I know some of my customers are also here, right? Uh, so. If that is the case, what is the prime two business of Starbucks today? When you enter into Starbucks uh, shop, basically. First is, one module should be order and pay. We go order from our mobile phones and make the payment before we get the coffee or not. And second is, 
loyalty program, Starbucks is known for loyalty program, right? They have the probably in the coffee world, they have the best loyalty program, right? And any guess how many orders, and there are different sources of making orders, right? One is through mobile phone, one is you walk in and make the order, right? Let's talk about mobile phone since all of us use mobile phone. How many, roughly how many orders through a mobile phone Starbucks must be getting today? Any guess? Wild guess? Millions? Absolutely. 2.5 million transactions. Average in a day. Huge? What we need then? If there are 2.5 million transactions happening through mobile phone, and this is, these transactions are only through mobile phone orders, not other orders I'm talking here. Right? If that is what is happening, do you think there is a need for sustainability to do something with these orders? Every order uses compute or not? Every order uses storage or not? Right? Energy is used or not? Right? Efficiency is compromised or not? So that means there is a huge need to make those optimized for Starbucks. And that's what Amazon Web Services helps him to help Starbucks to do. How we'll come back, but just keep this thought in mind. I'll give you another simple example. Again, Starbucks, website of Starbucks. We guys make a lot of websites, very nice looking websites, right? So that we can give better user experience to our users, attract users, right? We had a presentation about the retail stuff, right? So, and I saw some nice photographs there, nice images there as well, basically, right? So we, are, we make our websites very attractive with good images, what not basically to attract users to give them a better user experience. How many of us really think while making those websites, we are thinking about sustainability? Do you think a good website could lead into a good sustainable website? The images we use, do we think about the size of the images that we are going to use? A JavaScript, how thin it will be or how thick it will be? Am I going to use a loosely coupled architecture or tightly coupled architecture, right? So those are the things we need to start thinking to start with when we think about sustainability. You guys agree with me on this? Okay. But many times we go by what business needs, how good the site will look, what performance will be without really forgetting, without forgetting about how sustainable it could be for the world, for our future, right? Good. So that's a good definition, but just to give you a little context, Amazon is very, very serious about sustainability, right? Those of you know about the climate pledge that Amazon and Global Optimism did in September 2019, right? The commitment is to meet the Paris Agreement sustainability goals 10 years ahead, okay? And what is that sustainability goal? net zero carbon by 2040. Big numbers, right? And this is what Jeff Bezos and Amazon has committed to the world. It will be net zero carbon by 2040, point number one. Second, 100% renewable energy by 2025. All data centers, AWS Cloud, those of you are using, will be run by 100% renewable energy by 2025. Some other commitment, 50% shipments net zero carbon by 2030. At least 50% of the shipments will have net zero carbon by 2030. That's the big commitment that Jeb Bezos has given to the world, has given to the industry and given to all of us together across the globe. Right? Good. So that's good commitment. You guys agree to that? And we are in the right direction to meet that commitment as well. Right? Otherwise, I will not be talking here. Okay? Good. So, that's the Amazon standpoint, overall data center standpoint. But if we really come to the ground, look at our business, what is happening? There are two things, and we all know that. We had security discussion and other stops earlier. We all know that. To make the business successful, shared services model is the key, right? So before coming to the shared services model, just me, let me just take you uh, through some points on the cloud. I think that will make sense. So if you really look at Amazon Cloud today, we are 3.6 times more energy efficient as compared to median enterprise data centers in the US. 3.6 times more energy efficient, Amazon Cloud, right? The data centers. 
80-80% lower carbon footprint. That's what AWS Cloud is popular. And these are public numbers. It's not that some numbers I'm talking about. This is done by 451 Research. Right? You guys can Google it and find more, the, more details around this as well. Right? So Amazon Cloud today performs same task with 80-80% lower carbon footprint as compared to some of the other cloud providers. Right? Good. So how the data center is becoming, I won't say that it's 100% energy efficient today. You guys saw the commitment. But over a period of time, we are going to be energy efficient, right? Having said that, how do we really operate? We strongly believe on a partnership model between our customers and us, where AWS commits to what we call as sustainability of the cloud. Anything of the cloud, AWS is responsible for sustainability of that. In the same time, we expect our customers should also be aware of, should also be taking care of sustainability in the cloud. When I say sustainability of the cloud, what does that mean? About servers, about cooling, about water, about the wastage management that we heard about, or data centers, global infrastructure, what not, right? Regions and other things that some of you who work on AWS cloud probably know what I'm talking, right? In the same time, sustainability in the cloud is all about the applications that you build, right? DevSecOps, no, we're talking DevSecOps here, right? The applications that you build, applications that you deploy. Should your customer be aware of that or not? It's their business, right? That's why it's very important to make the sustainability of the cloud and sustainability in the cloud work together so that you can achieve sustainability through the cloud at the end. Together, jointly, you attend the sustainability through the cloud. That's basically the AWS philosophy when it comes to sustainability, right? Good, so now I'll come to the second part of my presentation. With this backdrop, with this high-level thinking of what we are trying to achieve when it comes to sustainability, how AWS is architecting for sustainability. Now I'll ask a question probably. How many of you know something called as OL Architected Framework? WAF. Okay. Quite, quite a lot of you, right? So our architecture philosophy revolves around what we call as OL Architected Framework. Earlier, OL Architected Framework used to have five pillars, right? Today, we have added on another pillar, which is called sustainability. So when we think about architect, architecture, when we talk about architecture, we address operational excellence, we address security. In fact, at Amazon, the philosophy is security is job zero, right? Everybody and anybody has to practice security no matter what role they do. That's why we call it, before the job starts, it's job zero basically, right? Without security, nothing works. So operational excellence, security, reliability and resiliency that we are hearing today, right? Performance, as well as cost optimization. Those are the things we used to take into account when we are thinking about architecture practices and principles in AWS. Now we have sustainability is the additional pillar that's part of our architecture philosophy and architecture best practices. What do we do there, basically? If I talk about sustainability, when I talk about sustainability of building applications, all of us know from the previous definition that I was talking about, three things that we, again, I think I'm talking more three things today, right? So three things we need to really think about. First is impact on environment. Very good. What is the second thing? Impact on energy consumption, correct? And third thing is your efficiency, right? So those are the three things we check, whether we are building a workload from in a cloud native architecture or we are migrating a workload from existing, you had the legacy discussion today as well during the panel, right? Le existing legacy mainframes to newer technologies moving into AWS cloud or it could be modernizing your existing legacy workloads to newer architecture, right? So all those places, we think about these three parameters. How do you do that? Any guess, any one of you? We have a tool. Those of you using AWS, do you know there's a tool that AWS has to address what is going on today in terms of environment, in terms of 
energy efficiency, energy consumption and efficiency. We have a tool and you can use that and automatically you can find out what is your carbon footprint. Right? It's called AWS Carbon Footprint Tool. Freely available. Any of you can go ahead and use this. Starbucks did that. The example I was giving, I think I kept the story there. Now I'm coming back. Starbucks did that. The mission of Starbucks is that how do they find out for every transaction that happens, every order that happens through the mobile phone, what is the carbon footprint? Does that make sense? If they know that, then throughout the workload life cycle, can they manage, monitor, track the carbon footprint? Possible or not? And if that is possible, is it cost contributing to the sustainability goals? Yes, of course, right? So that's what is basically the philosophy here. So improve de deployment, development processes. So three things basically, right? Again, another three things. Three things when we are talking about sustainability, it's all about optimization, correct? And when you are optimizing, what do you need to optimize? Any guess? Three things you have to optimize. Optimize your code. Code optimization is very key, right? Which many times we don't really look at, right? What are the second optimization required? Resource optimization, infrastructure optimization. Very good. What are the third thing? We are talking architecture, right? Architecture optimization. All three optimization levers are very, very important when you are trying to achieve your sustainability goals. How do I do the architecture optimization? It's all about using best practices, architectural practices and principles, design for sustainability, right? So there is so much content, so much research, so much work available today, basically. So architecture, of, like I gave you, if you are moving from a mainframe world, just to keep the panel discussion uh, aligned here, right? If you're moving from a mainframe world to newer world, how do you do it? 50 million line of code, Tom made it. Either Tom is extinct from this world today, or Tom has become a manager. Code is there, code is running. Documentation, either is, not, none of us like to do documentation, at least I don't like, right? Either documentation is not in place, or even if it's in place, it's not in sync with the source code. So how do I modernize then? Big problem, right? 50 million line of code and that runs all my mission critical business process, logic, workflows, everything is entrapped within the code. That's the single version of truth for me. That's my asset basically, right? Can I put 100 people to analyze 50 million line of code to create documents which customer has no clue to validate and start paying you? That's why most of the modernization projects doesn't really kick off or even if they kick off, they fail, right? How do you do it? Can we use some standard smart mechanisms by which, uh, I have a patent in fact in this space, can I have a smart mechanism where I can do the source code analysis automatically, parsing the source code, creating the metadata, storing in the document, storing in a database and then creating the documentation out of it. I saw uh, CAST is one of the sponsors probably, right? CAST has beautiful analytics tools, right? Uh, for the source, when it comes to source code, right? Even going to the level of extracting business logic, rules and workflows from the source code. Can I convert and then reverse engineer it to some kind of base UML diagram, even if it is not a good UML diagram, still the monolithic 15 million line of code is now available visually on a design pattern and then I can refine it. And there are of course a lot of forward engineering techniques today that you can add up to even create running and deployable code. So those are the things that's happening today to address the sustainability parameters and architectural optimization parameters. Those of you have interest, I know we'll probably not have time to talk too much, but those of you have interest on this topic, uh, there is something called OMG. You guys heard of this? Not oh my God, right? It's object management group, right? Go to omg.org and you'll find a lot of literature on which I'm talking now basically, right? So that's architecture optimization. Now you talked about the infrastructure optimization or resource optimization, right? What is resource optimization? Is it required to do, right? Those of you use AWS Cloud, do you have unused instances lying there? Do you face that problem? Your cost goes up, then AWS team comes and say that we'll do cost optimization, cloud financial management, we'll establish the FinOps practice for you. Does that happen or not? I'm sure some of you will relate to this. I know maybe you are not talking, but you will definitely relate to this. Correct? So how do you really do that? I'll give you an example. Graviton. How many of you have heard of something called Graviton? Graviton with EC2 instance. What is the advantage? 
40% price performance as compared to any standard x86 processors and 60% lesser carbon footprint. Will you use Graviton or not? That, that's basically the resource utilization I'm talking about, right? Minimize, isolate, or delete the unused instances, right? And uh, you have the carbon footprint tool, you can always measure, monitor, and see what's your carbon footprint by doing the improvements. When Starbucks started this journey, they were not aware that they are doing sustainability. Their whole idea was that, how do I improve cost? Do the cost optimization. To improve cost, do you think by removing an unused instance, using spot instances, will improve cost or not? That's what it all started there and then culminated into what we call sustainability that Starbucks achieved basically, right? Good, so I'm, I'm not going to read through this slide, probably you guys already have seen this. I'll go to the next one. How I'm doing on time, is it okay? I'll take some time. Okay, good. So I talked about this earlier, moving to sustainability through the cloud. So of the cloud, in the cloud, shared responsibility, Finally, together with customer, with your partners, with the service providers, everybody has to work together to achieve, achieve, attain sustainability through the cloud, right? That's my second part of uh, session. Now I'll move to the third part. How to start with DevSecOps sustainability, right? I already talked about this, right? Your architecture should be Highly tightly coupled or loosely coupled? Loosely coupled, right? Highly decoupled. That's what we mean by loosely coupled architecture. So that you can do plug and play. When you are doing for a sustainable solution, solutions will change over a period of time or not? So your architecture should be in a position to adapt to those changes, adapt to those new solutions in a plug and play method basically, right? So having a highly decoupled architecture and that's what we do in many of our DevSecOps Implementation, starting from your continuous business planning to continuous, how many continuous? Continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, continuous monitoring, continuous testing, what not basically, I'll not go in there now. You guys know this because all of you raised your hand when I asked about DevSecOps, right? So highly decoupled architecture and how Amazon is achieving this. Let's look at this slide, speed up deployment at Amazon.com. I'm assuming most of you or all of you use Amazon.com, right? Yes or no? Do you think the Amazon.com that you see today was there when Jeff Bezos built Amazon.com in 1990 or 1990? Or it has gone through architectural changes? What do you think? Gone through. DevOps was not there at that time, right? 1990 probably DevOps was coming up as a concept, right? So coming here, what is speed of deployment in Amazon.com? Now some guesswork. Who will guess this? Unfortunately, I don't have any prize. Uh, I'll leave it to ma'am if she has some prizes. But what is speed of deployment at Amazon.com? Any guess? Yeah? Seconds? Let's guess. Average time between deployments weekly. Six point six seconds. Now you can imagine the massive thing that we are talking about, but still we are committing to sustainability, right? So that, that's possible because of the architectural things that we're doing. It's not that we, we kind of got this from the very beginning when Amazon.com was built, right? And can you guess, among the top three buyers from Amazon.com, one of the names, can you tell me, who are the top, top three buyers of Amazon.com? I just need one name out of the three. Any other guess, better guess? Jeff Bezos is among the one of the top three buyers of Amazon.com. Why? Is it because he has a lot of money? Is it because he has a lot of money, that's why he's going and buying from his website, Amazon.com? Experience. Be on your customer's shoes and experience what pain your customers are going through and make changes. That's his intent, basically, right? To do that, so, and that's why I was telling how the entire joining changed, basically. Four more minutes, okay. We'll have some offline discussion outside then, okay? So, uh, anyway, so I think then probably I'm losing time. So when uh, it started, when Amazon.com started, we, call, we used to call it as Obidos. I, was, I talked about the legacy mainframe. Obidos, so Amazon.com was one application, a huge monolith. Now you can imagine the performance, the sustainability, what was there basically. Nothing was there, right? 
Obidos is basically a narrow part of Amazon River in Brazil, narrowest part. That used to be the choking point, basically, right? And it was not working. Customers not, were not happy, basically, right? From there, what happened? Service-oriented architecture came into picture, right? So the Obidos was broken into what is called Gurupa. So Gurupa is basically in a delta in Amazon River. So they broke that huge monolith to multiple smaller monoliths. As you see there on the slide, finance is one application, ordering is one application, catalog is one application, right? Is it better? Definitely better than the monolith. But is it the best? No, but we didn't have microservices that time, no? Correct? So then came the microservices world. Today, if you look at the Amazon.com, 100,000 plus microservices, right? Utilizes, and those of you who use AWS probably know, utilizes 200 plus AWS services today. Black box to each other, right? So, so that if something goes wrong also, you know the benefit of microservices, right? Business logic and data only accessible through the APIs, right? So what was the mission there? We know that we have to deploy things faster, as you saw, 6.6 seconds, right? And break things over and over again. I'm probably falling short of time, otherwise I'd have talked about observability, chaos engineering, and other stuff here. But those of you are interested, you can do offline. But the whole mission was break things over and over again to make that process streamlined, and we came up with a solution. Very simple solution with few AWS services. That's our DevSecOps pipeline that we practice, right? And some of the services must be known to you guys. And we didn't stop there. We went one step ahead, and we did what? Now things should speak, right? We connected with who? With what to make it speak? The pipeline should speak. Alexa, very good, right? So now, that's the next step where we use the DevSecOps pipeline today, basically, right? I don't know how many of you use this not. If not, then you should definitely attempt to do that. Services I'm not going to talk about, right? So these are the foundation services to meet our sustainability goals for different buckets, whether it's protect, whether it's define, whether it's state, test, whether it's monitor, and I think there are some discussion around, I think you talked about monitoring, logging, tracking, right? Uh, in the observability part, you and I think Horst, or I forget his name. So both of you are talking about that, right? So, but the problem there still remains because many of the monitoring tools, and uh, today everybody, everyone else buy tools, right? Finally, customers end up with a museum of tools there, basically, right? With, they have multiple tools, but they don't know how to really make, connect those data to get insights out of it, right? So tools are good, but you need to know how to use it. And the other problem with the tools are basically, many of the tools are focused around predicting the unknown from known parameters. But system dynamics is such a way that there are many unknowns that you have not come, come across. How do you predict unknown from unknown? It's still an area of research. Once that is done, probably that will become more foolproof, basically. Right? But yeah, but monitoring, tracking, logging is probably most of the tools that you use today are capable of doing it along with Amazon services. Okay, so just to cut the long story short, if you are going to start the joining of sustainability, at least minimally we should take these baby steps. And these are not, that's why I'm calling it as baby steps because these are not difficult steps. What are those baby steps? Minimum adhere to sustainability development practices, become a sustainable technologist, possible or not? Think about anything, any development, any code you are writing, am I writing this code sustainable? Go back to the definition, layman definition that I gave you. What is meeting my need? Is it going to meet the future generation's need in the same way? Start with that. Adopt environmentally responsible design, carbon footprint I already talked about. You have tools available, use that. Of course, I talked about AWS tools, other cloud providers, other uh, service providers also has their own tools. It's not that you should use only AWS uh, carbon footprint tools. You, can, you are free to use any of those tools. Infrastructure as code and serverless computing, given, right? Reduce underutilized cloud resources. Basic, many of us make mistake there. And we cry that, okay, my cost is going on, cloud provider is really charging me more. Of course, cloud provider into business, they have to earn money, but you need to have the basics right at your place, right? Why do you, why need to have the unused resources? Why don't I go for a spot instances? No brainer, basically, right? Select energy efficiency data storage options, automation, and alerts to save power, right? It should not go on, basically, even if you don't need it. Major energy utilization by application. I already gave you the Starbucks example. Cost optimization by reducing, optimizing your runs. These are the baby steps I think any of us can do, can practice, not difficult at all. And that should be a very good starting point in your uh, sustainability journey and to 
help you become a uh, sustainable technologist. That's what I call. Right? Good. So the end of the day, again, we talked about resiliency on the panel, right? So the whole idea is we need to build resilient uh, businesses. Anyone know that diagram, that image there? What is that? Yeah? Very good. Your closure, like it. What is its name? It's study great. Okay? It's the most resilient creature across the globe. It can support the highest temperature condition. It can support the most frigid condition. It can stay. It's a microscopic creature. It can stay without food, without water for ages. Somehow it has managed the art of being resilient. Today businesses need that, right? Failures are going to happen. Failures are part of life. But how fast you could get out of that failure and uh, make your applications self-filling, make your businesses self-filling, that's the resiliency today businesses need to become successful in today's context. No matter what other surprise we can get uh, next that's coming to us. So we need to really think about how do we really make our business resilient, ma make our business, and you heard Nilajri saying resiliency and sustainability are related to each other, right? That's what we need to think about. There are multiple resources available from AWS, right? Um, you can go through those links available. Uh, you can just go to AWS.com and you'll find uh, Amazon.AWS.com. You'll find a lot of uh, details there. So just uh, have a look when you have free time. And then this is my favorite slide. Okay, what do you think? What comes to your mind when you see this slide? Yeah? You see the toddler? This slide, by the way, is not mine. It's one of my customer, which is AXA, which is an insurance company, right? Uh, this was used by AXA's CIO, Peter Nautilus, uh, I think four years back in AWS New York Summit, and I have borrowed this slide from him, right? So what, I like this slide. That's why I, in all my presentations, probably I somehow touch this slide, basically. Yeah? The kid is trying to jump and learn swimming, right? Take a plan. Many times we do a lot of analysis paralysis. We do a lot of thinking, right? Before doing something. We do that or not? But the best way to learn is to jump, right? And while jumping, you see the smile on the toddler's face. After all, learning depth checkups, learning sustainability is good fun, right? So this is time for all of us to jump and start practicing sustainability so that we can make our life better and we can build a better world for our future generation, right? Thank you very much. That's what I wanted to share with you. <laughs>